Hello and welcome, Champions of Milk. I have a Hollow Luck Bleed build for y'all. And this one will be optimized for using the Onikiri and Ubidachi. And you gotta be hollowed up if you're making a hollow build, since it gives you that bonus to your luck stat if you are ho above 15 hollowing. So you gotta do that your your quest line for a build like this. And it is the best way to use this Twin Katana. One thing, let's start at the top, let's start with Vigor. You want a lot of HP if you're using this weapon. The weapon art, Oni Slayer, yes, it's got that incredibly fast knee startup strike. However, it also has hyper armor throughout most of its animation. So to take advantage of hyper armor, you need to have health to be making trades if, if that's what you're looking to do. So even if you're used to playing with a lot of low health, you don't think you need it. If you're using this weapon, if you're using a hyper armor uh, weapon in general, I'd really recommend investing in Vigor. Endurance is quite low since uh, I had to fit in a lot of points. I would really recommend making sure you start with the warrior class since the points are so tight and that's going to give you the very best stat spread possible with that low attunement. And the, the endurance still gives you enough to do those combos. You can do a, a 2L1 combo in the weapon art and then another L1 still have time to roll away and with that Chloranthi ring your, your stamina will come back really quick. I really recommend the Chloranthi Ring, and I really recommend just kind of trying to work with that 30 Vigor, because being able to have that, uh, I'm sorry, 30 Endurance, being able to have that 40 Vigor, being able to have that 35 Strength and fit in the Night Ring if you want, uh, I'd really recommend keeping the Strength at 35 instead of the Dex, since a lot of the best weapons for a Quality Luck Bleed build, like these Karthus weapons, uh, the washing pole, they slightly tend to favor deck scaling. And that's the same for the Onikuri and Upadachi. Sometimes it can be deceiving if it says CC, but not all Cs are equal. And I can guarantee you that the Onikuri and Upadachi really favors that deck scaling. So that's the one you really want to make sure you hit that soft cap of 40 with. If you want to make cuts to fit endurance in, I'd really probably recommend taking it out of strength since that you don't get as much bang for your buck there especially since you're using a twin weapon and twin weapons do not get that two-handed scaling strength bonus uh, dex's bonus is cast speed and fall damage pretty useless to us and lux bonus is not really shown yeah the item discovery whatever lux bonus in combat is that the hollow infusion path gives you a boost to your lux stat so your weapon infusion actually increases your damage stat that it scales off of. That's pretty efficient. And as an efficiency guy who loves me some, some min-maxing, I, I fucking love it. Uh, so, this, this quality luck build was pretty fun to make. I'd recommend a consumable bar setup like this for invasions, for sure. That Karthus Rouge and the Lloyd's Talismans. And a couple blue flasks to keep that uh, weapon arc going. Because that weapon art is just so deadly and is your bread and butter for applying burst damage and taking out very aggressive hosts and phantoms. For duels, you could choose from a variety of throwables. Uh, with strength and dex, any of them works well, but most importantly you want to fit on that Karthus Rouge and make things bleed absurdly quick and everything will die. And the Lloyd's Talismans if you're invading, but not something you want for duels. For duels, I would recommend the Leo Ring over the Hornet Ring, but that's up to you. The two middle ring slots are kind of very flexible. I'd really recommend Chloranthi just because of the low endurance and kind of that extra boost it provides, which cannot be stacked with the grass and is almost twice the value of the grass in terms of stamina region. And for that first slot, I'd really recommend doing Princess Ring, Life Ring swap, swaps. Uh, since you can't have a blessed offhand, you're going to want that regen and you're going to want to keep that window open and use the menu button to get out of there once you've done your swap instead of spamming the cancel button which I do often so I've got to I've got to work on that ring swapping and it's very important on a luck build so luck the hollow infusion it keeps the natural scaling of the weapon for the most part and it also gives you that luck bonus with the hollowing and it also adds luck scaling so it's basically just the best melee build in terms of optimized damage output. However, it's not the most effective melee build for most weapons, I would say. 
not a whole lot of weapons benefit as much from that extra investment into luck and the hollow path as others. It's going to be weapons that are also getting that bonus that luck provides to bleed, so weapons with innate bleed. Things like the Zonikiri Badachi, the Katanas, the Karthus Curve Sword, the Claws, though those are very heavily scaled towards Dex and would probably be better with a Dex uh, luck build. So just as an example, the Goddard Twin Swords, very popular weapon. How much would they gain uh, over a 40-40 build, or a 35-40 in this case, versus a hollow? So you have to kind of ignore the screen. I forgot to put on the Night Ring, and I don't have the Infusion Gems. So I just went on Mugen Monkey, and I grabbed some numbers for you all for comparison of the Goddard Twin Swords on a quality luck build versus a pure quality build. And we're going to be doing this with ideal stats, so a 40-40 for the quality build and a 40-40-40 for the quality luck. And on a quality build, you get 389 AR with the Goddard Twin Swords. And on a quality luck, that goes up to 413, with for a difference of 24 AR. So let's say you start with the Knight class and you get 7 luck and you're shaving off 23 luck that you invested to bring that luck up to 30. So you're gaining 23 stat points and you're losing 24 AR. I think it's worth it in that case. However, with the Onikiri and Ubidachi, on a pure quality build, it's going to be 396 AR with no bonus to luck, uh, no bonus to bleed that luck provides. And with that luck, it goes up to 441 on the quality luck build. That's a difference of 45 AR. So it's definitely something you have to think about on a weapon-by-weapon -weapon basis. The Karthus Curve Sword is another good one. The Karthus Curve Great Sword is kind of one since it has that bleed. However, it's also got a lot of strength scaling. Um, so it's really something you have to treat on a weapon-by-weapon -weapon basis and what you're trying to do with the weapon, how important is that bleed element. And it's worth noting that a lot of these weapons, the Karthus Curve Sword, Onikiri no Badachi, the Claws, they tend to favor deck scaling. And that's more accentuated by the fact that they're twin weapons and don't get that extra strength scaling bonus when two-handed. So a good alternate to this build would be Dex Luck, in my opinion. Nice way to shave points. If you like to do parries, since this is a twin weapon and you're going to be two-handing it most of the time, I'd really recommend having a fist weapon in your offhand. And these are going to be your best options since they also have innate bleed. And the choice between them is basically going to be which weapon art do you prefer. And I prefer the Mannequin Claws for invasions a lot of the time since that quick step can be very handy, particularly in certain environments. And I kind of just like the style of them better. However, the Claws have more AR and a handy weapon art that is almost identical to the Oni Slayer. However, is ever so slightly different, maybe even better. The Oni Slayers is a little bit slower. So there's two Oni Slayers back to back, and here's two Jump Slashes back to back. Bit quicker, and they're basically the same thing. They both have Hyper Armor, they both have that Knee Strike, which I'll talk about later. And for invasions, again, you're going to want to look at your rings and switch things up. The Hornet will probably serve you a lot better than the Leo. However, I'd say the Leo is going to serve you better in most cases in uh, those really tough duels. But it's up to you. You can always put in Undead Rings, Obscuring Rings, the Night Ring to hit your 40 soft cap, uh, maybe the Pontiff's Right Eye, that one for successive attacks. I don't know, I've never really used it. But I'd really recommend that Chloranthi Ring and either the Leo or the Hornet Ring, and then that Life Princess Ring for a swap, since the meta is really having that blessed offhand, and a lot of people are doing Princess Rings on top, swaps on top of that. You're going to want some regen since you do not have the option of having a blessed offhand. Unless you're going to try and cut some points somewhere to get 35 luck so that you could have a blessed offhand and a hollow main hand. Alright. For your backup, I'd really recommend the composite bow. Just mention that kind of quickly and show it quickly, but. It's something I talk about in a lot of other videos, how useful it is as a pressure or as a finisher. Uh, but let's move on to the moveset here. So the R1s combo into one more R1 if you catch somebody. And the R1 will also combo into an L1. The L1s will combo into another L1 and that'll deliver four strikes, heavy bleed buildup and heavy damage. And the R1 into L1 combo is a little bit safer. The R1 comes out a bit quicker than the L1. 
and that'll let you land that combo just slightly easier for a little bit of a loss in damage. Now, the Onikiri and Ubadachi actually have the worst run and attack of all katanas in the game. So as you see here with the washing pole, you can queue up running attacks and delay them and run back and forth with no pivot animation. However, with the Onikiri and Ubadachi, since you cannot block while two-handing them, let's say if you have a shield, you can get around this, uh, but most of the time you want to two-hand it because it's all about that weapon art. So that is a major, major, major drawback of this katana. Uh, in addition to having the shorter range, it just isn't as good at providing that run-in punish or pressure. And that running L1, it looks really sweet, but the range is awful and the recovery time on it is absurdly long compared to how quickly the startup and the recovery of that regular running R1 are. So just to show you spamming roll right out of the running R1 compared to how slowly it comes out with that running L1. It's pretty, pretty tiresome. <laughs> but that weapon art gotta love that weapon art so that's why I love this thing and those L1s are so beautiful and if you can land that running L1 it actually does incredible damage so for punishing parry fishers you've got that running attack you can run up and telegraph a running attack and then hit him with that knee stun from the Oni Slayer or you can charge up those R2s which actually do very very hefty damage since the thrust attacks deliver extra counter damage. So if you're hitting an enemy during their attack animation with that and you've got your Leo ring on top of it which is going to provide an extra 25%, that and the running attack are going to be a lot more effective if you can catch the enemy during an animation. The rolling attacks are pretty good. Uh, the L1, it's got a slightly slower startup than the rolling R1. However, the animation overall is basically the same. So I'd really say you really want to be trying to use that rolling L1 a lot more than the rolling R1. They're both very easy to parry, and they both have very similar parry timings, so they're not really a mix-up, and they both have pretty much the same overall animation length, but the rolling L1 delivers a lot more damage. All right, so to do cued back steps, you want to be tapping circle, as you start the animation of the attack you want the cute back step to come out of. Then you hold the analog stick in the direction you want that, uh, or in the opposite of the direction you want that back step to come out in, and then you can finally hit R1 if you want to do that running attack to follow up. The timing is going to be slightly different for every attack, and if you get it wrong, it's usually going to be a backwards roll, since usually you're going to be trying to send these back steps right in front of you. And it's something you just kind of need to practice a lot. Since the timing is going to be slightly different for every attack, uh, it's something that just requires tons and tons of practice and muscle memory. It also requires you to play at least partially unlocked, so it's a very advanced technique and something that I'm not really doing very often quite yet. Now, for the Oni Slayer, there's two parts to the attack. As you see here, this enemy is being stunned very early on in the animation before the slash actually comes out. So that's this knee strike or knee stun that everybody's talking about. And it kind of counts as a headshot basically if you get it right. And headshot stuns are extremely, extremely powerful and can knock people out of most animations. So if you can land this at very close range, you can deliver a quick, quick stun to interrupt enemies, ideally, before you even deliver that strike. And it effectively makes the attack much quicker than it actually is, because if the enemy can't move, you might as well be attacking instantly, if you're instantly immobilizing them. Uh, and that's really what people are so uh, up in arms about in, the, in terms of this attack. Um, of course, it's really the damage and the, the bleed potential and all that, but if it, were so, uh, if it were slower and easier to dodge, uh, and if it weren't such an incredible punish at close range and a reactive punish at that, this weapon wouldn't be nearly the powerhouse it is, and I think that's honestly the more powerful thing over the damage. I think the damage is what needs to get toned down, but the true power in that weapon art relies in that knee stun. 
Alright, so a quick thing on poise and hyper armor, or what we really should be calling super armor. Uh, so, hyper armor means during an attack animation, no matter what hits you, you will not be staggered. Super armor means during an attack animation, depending on what hits you, you will not be staggered. And there's so many different things that go into what the super armor is in this game. Poise is one of them, but it's a very sort of situational one, where if you take a hit, I believe it doesn't have to be a hit during super armor frames, I believe it just has to be any kind of damage that you take, it will now check your poise value when you go into a hyper anima armor animation within the next 30 seconds, uh, and, it will t and depending on what is hitting you and what your poise value is and what hit you before and... There's just so many crazy variables to it. I've, I'm sorry the, the answer here is murky, but uh, in addition to this, in addition to poise, what really is even more important is the weapon that is hitting you. So is it a great sword? Is it a straight sword? Uh, that depend That's going to make a big difference on whether you're going to get broken out of your hyper armor, including what attack in the R1 chain it is. First, R1s do more poise damage. So I'm sorry about how murky and that info is but I'm doing my best and I'll try and figure more out so please subscribe if you want regular updates and more Souls stuff PvE PvP all the goodness and more games as they become of interest and over here on the right I'm gonna put up a annotation for the playlist for all my PvP videos I've done a bunch on the Onikiri and Ubadachi a bunch of pyro stuff and you know low-level cosplay peruse it at your interest and I hope you enjoy so thank you for sticking to the end I know this was a long one. Hope you learned something or was able to bear with it at least. And I hope you have fun with this amazing weapon and stay milky.